Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Jew and Gentile podcast. I am your host, Chris Katolka, and with me is my co-host, Steve Hersey. Steve, how are you doing? I am doing great, Chris. Well, we are first podcast of 2022. I just, you're right. I didn't think about that, I, but I, that's I, correct. I only thought about it because I was organizing our stuff. I was putting all the folders together, and and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the first one for 2022. Happy 2022. And we're going to keep this study going of Leviticus. Oh, man, I hope people aren't bored. (laughs) I think we're in the middle of something great, but hold on. Here we go. All right, well, we've got a great show for you lined up. We are going to continue our study in Leviticus. We're doing Leviticus chapter 23. We're picking up um, with Pentecost. We've gone through the Sabbath celebration. We've gone through Passover. Um, We've gone through the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and now we're moving into another fall. Oh, and the the Feast of... uh, what is it? The Feast of First Fruits. And barley. That, the barley. That's right. And now we're going into um, Pentecost. But you know something, Chris, what happened last time? We thought we were going to get through one chapter. You only have a certain number of words you say. <laughs> and when you use them up, God calls you back. And I raised my hand and said, I think I'd be dead already. <laughs> <laughs> and Chris, we were supposed to take one session and do seven feasts. We said too many words. You know, did you think like your rabbi, like we better just cut this off now? Like, because it was, I was actually very thankful for you that you said, we got to stop this now. We do. Before it goes to, where this will be a three hour podcast. Exactly. We don't want to do that. That your delegation skills, your time management skills are amazing. Oh, so. no. What was going on in my head is ding, 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 ding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that has nothing to do with it. It was just that we were, I think what we said was pertinent and important. But it was going to be too much to go through all seven. But it, it is a, a tradition amongst very ultra orthodox Jewish people that God has that number up there, and that's why the rabbis, or in in Hasidic communities, the Rebbe mm. hardly says anything. Really, they hardly talk. Uh, if you read, um, my name is Asher Lev. In the beginning, the chosen they made mm-hmm. that into a movie. Uh, it's about a Hasidic a young man and an Orthodox man and their, their students and their relationship. Uh, when he had to go, when the Hasidic young man had to go to the, the Rebbe, his father, uh, his father hardly talked. And that's because of that tradition. Really? Your, your words are, they can kill you. Every, <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing. I never thought about that. That's interesting. Sure. I remember you saying before, about the idea that your words, you know, can number your days, you know, exactly. Uh, but that's funny. It that, never stopped me. That's, <laughs> but you're still here. I'm still here. You're so still far. here. God, maybe you, God gave me a huge number. Uh, that's right. You got a big dictionary, right? <laughs> uh, well, th- we're going to continue our study in Leviticus. And, um, and we, before we do that though, we want to highlight a few things. Number one, coming up January 20th, you're not going to want to miss this. We are going to be doing a celebration of Zvi Kalisher's life. And if you don't know who Zvi is, Zvi is a Holocaust survivor uh, uh, um, who immigrated after the Holocaust uh, uh, over to Israel. Um, and when he landed in Israel, he was put to war right away. I mean, uh, the War of Independence was going on. Um, and he fought during the War of Independence. And during that time, I believe he was in Haifa, Israel, he, a, a woman gave him a Bible. And he opened the Bible, and it, he opened it to a psalm, I believe Psalm 37. And there it says in the passage, uh, though your father or your, and your mother forsake you, I will never forsake, forsake you. The Lord exactly, will never. Exactly. Exactly. Right. It impacted him all through his whole life, the yep. rest of his life. He never forgot that verse he quoted to me numerous times and he ends up becoming a friends of israel representative an outreach do, giving outreach uh you know doing evangelism all throughout jerusalem um and his legacy is amazing and people look at anybody i encounter that know friends of israel uh they know v and this is going to be a great testimony of his life his legacy so first week steve we're going to have elwood mcquade on and explain why that's important well, Elwood McQuaid wrote the book, Zvi, the biography, Zvi. Elwood McQuaid, when he was a pastor in Virginia, had um, Victor Buxbazen in to speak as a supporting, as a church that supports the ministry of the Friends of Israel and was introduced through Victor to the ministry of Friends of Israel and thereby Zvi Kalisher. And they built a strong relationship through the years. Uh, 
Zvi, uh, uh, the, after Victor, it was Marvin Rosenthal, and Zvi was, Marv brought him to the States, uh, had him speak in banquets ground. I was in Chicago and uh, had him speak in various places, everywhere that Zvi went, everywhere. People were fascinated. First of all, they'd read about him. And when you, you know, you read about him, you think of him as a lion. Yeah. This is, this is a man who is, who's not intimidated by anyone and will speak to anyone, spoke 11 different languages, never went further than the fourth grade, powerful witness. And he was five feet, two inches. Yeah. (laughs) He made me feel tall, (laughs) but powerful, just a powerful guy, uh, fearless. He used to say, if I can go through the things I went to, you think I'm afraid to tell somebody about my savior? Mm. He's, he wasn't afraid of anybody or anything as it related to the gospel. And God used him in so many am- amazing ways. Uh, we still tell the stories of Zvi. We tell them on the radio program uh, through Apples of Gold. We tell them through our magazine, Israel, My Glory. You know, a lot of the ministries that we have, um, you know, the legacy of Zvi, and a lot of the le- of the ministry that we have today, and it's even the legacy of the ministry that continues in Israel with his son and grandchildren. And why don't you talk about what we can expect on January twenty seventh? What a privilege uh, it is! Uh, we had this idea, you and I, and you contacted uh, Menno and then Danny, who both serve with the Ministry of Friends of Israel. And when their daughter Yael found out that they agreed to to do this kind of thing and talk about. Uh, Menno's dad and their grandfather. She contacted you, Chris, and said, I want in. Why Why can't I be in this? Mm-hmm. And there's an excitement that I personally have because uh, we're going to get the perspective from Elwood as the executive director, as, as a man who traveled to Poland with Zvi to go back to his very house that his mother took him from to the orphanage. And uh, Elwood knows all that information. And so we'll get to see that personal and professional side, but then the family side. I'm just as excited of the second week as I am the first week. Yeah, I am too. And so, listen, if you're if you want to join, it's actually really simple. All you have it's free. Number one, Steve, free. I love free. You love free. Free is great. We want it to be a time of fellowship. And you know what I love about our online classes that we do with uh, FOI Equip is that they are a time of fellowship. You 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 you, you can't really fathom it because it's digital, but man, we have people from all around the world who are joining on, who are talking about uh, the Lord, who want to learn about the scriptures. It's just a great time to engage with people that we don't know, but we know we're family in the Lord. Um, But if you want to register for this class, V the Legacy, all you have to do is go to gofoi.org forward slash ZV Legacy. That's Z-V-I- Legacy, all one Z6, word. Six. That's people right. People tell me. That's right. Who I would like to read the story from Z six. You mean Zv? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's 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 gofoi.org forward slash Zv Legacy. It's a Zoom class. It's going to be Thursday. We're going to start Thursday, January twentieth, seven thirty p.m. Eastern time. And then the next week, it's going to be the same. Thir- it'll be Thursday night, but on the twenty seventh. Uh, and that will be with Menno and family. Uh, 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 it won't be. It won't be seven thirty Eastern time in Israel. No, when they're talking. They're waking up bright and early for us to do this too. So I'm very. I'm thankful that they're going to be doing that. Uh, and, and so, uh, be sure to register for that class. We've got so many exciting classes coming up. But again, go foi. You know, Chris, I want to. Uh, you, we weren't planning on talking about this, but I think I'd like you to real quickly. You know, equip. This is free. All this is free, but. You and I know that it took some expenses. This was an unbudgeted thing that we're doing here. Uh, there is no money towards here. We stepped out in faith. And as a result, we gave our people, that is those who have taken a quick course, as an opportunity with the, they'd like to give. What happened, Chris? Yeah, what? we were blown away by God's grace and and the response of our, of our friends. You know what I started calling them, Steve? I started thinking it, they're equippers. They are. That's a great. They're equippers. That great. Our, I like that. Our equippers got to work. They saw our need. Um, we sent out an email. We needed to raise five thousand dollars to cover Zoom fees and and all the different technology stuff. It all it adds up. You don't realize it, but over the course of a year, it adds up. And so uh, we received an over abundance of 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 resources and funds that came from our equippers who love the teaching. So we just want to give thanks to them. And maybe you're listening. Thank you so much for being a part of what we're doing with Equip. It's just very exciting. We do want to make this free and accessible to anybody who wants to listen. 
and we know that uh, some of the people who have listened to this podcast and who have taken a quick courses on their own have given uh, even before we ever asked, just because they tell us they don't get this kind of teaching and they're just so thrilled to have it. And we're glad to provide it. So it's a it's a symbiotic relationship. It really is. But we got that great one coming up. Z again, that's go foi.org slash go foi.org forward slash Zv legacy. Spit it out. Spit it out. Oi, I'm trying to. Oi. Okay. Anyway, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, Steve. Why don't you get us started? We're moving into Pentecost. Well, yeah. Last week we covered Passover. These are feasts to the Lord. The first we covered was Shabbat. Uh, that was very important. It happens 52 times a year. Uh, it's, it's family. It's extremely important. God outlines a time of rest. And then we talked about Passover, uh, unleavened bread, uh, first fruits, uh, and how those relate. And you wait 50 days after uh, the uh, first Shabbat in, uh, after Passover. Mm-hmm. You count 50 days. Pentecost. Uh, weeks, weeks. Shavuot. Uh, Shavuot in Hebrew is weeks. Pentecost uh, is, I, I, I believe that's Greek it, for yep, 50. Exactly. So we have uh, the idea though, is we're counting seven, seven weeks. That's 49 days. Seven 50 plus seven, one. Yeah. Plus one. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so it's 49 days plus the one is 50 on the 50th day. Uh, and Pentecost was the wheat first fruits. So you had, in fact, many Jewish people connect the two 50 days apart. You have first fruits, the barley. The uh, the priest uh, went and took the first of barley and and offered it to the Lord. The sim- similar way on the fiftieth day. Now they're getting the wheat and the and the it's a priestly ministry again, waving it before the Lord, uh, bringing it before Him. And this time they bake two loaves of leavened bread mm-hmm. that they have, uh, and that's significant. It's not. It's hard to explain from a Jewish point of view, uh, but it's much easier to explain from a Christian point of view. As as even though this was given to Israel, mm-hmm. and it was, the priests had responsibilities that they were supposed to do on the fiftieth day. Uh, but it is in in Judaism, first fruits of the barley is de-emphasized. Not a lot. Of, they don't spend a lot of. It's it's legit. It's real, but they spend more time with Shavuot. And the reason they do is from a traditional point of view, it is Shavuot, that Moses received the law. And that's significant because Jewish lives changed when they got the law. Mm -hmm. They were no longer the same. They were changed. Even though it's an outside thing, they did not have the law. And now on Pentecost, they receive, in fact, uh, some Jewish sources say, oh, the two loaves, that's the two tablets. That's the law. Uh, I don't. I don't know about that, but I do know that uh, the law, when Moses came down, it changed. It changed. I'm a. I was a beneficiary of that change. Before they're wandering in the desert, there Moses says God is there in appearance. They're seeing the light. They're seeing the uh, the pillar of fire during night and uh, cloud during the day. But now these laws, these are governing them. Their lives are changed. They're accountable in a different way. And so when I came to Christ and I knew about the Jewish side, but it's so inescapable once your eyes are open, how you as a Christian, anyone as a Christian can relate because Pentecost is a foundation yeah. to the church. Yeah, and that's I, I turned my Bible to Acts chapter 2. I because, have mine too. Oh, oh, we think alike. Look at that. Too. We, it's great minds think alike. <laughs> And so, you know, we're in Acts chapter two, because like you said, you know, it's something to be reminded, too, as we go through these feasts is that there were three feasts that the Jewish people were required to be in Jerusalem. You know, of the seven feasts of the year that make up the calendar year for the Jewish people, uh, three of them, they were required to worship. Deuteronomy 16. That's right. And three of them were, of course, Passover and and, uh, unleavened bread. They were they were required to be there. Uh, Pentecost. The feast of, of weeks, Shavuot, Shavuot. Yep. is so you have Jewish people from all around the world. They are in Jerusalem. They and must be there. They, they are must be there. there. That's right. And they're there to honor the Lord, to celebrate this, this feast that they're celebrating the harvest. They're giving thanks to the Lord for what he's done. The giving of the law. There's a lot of amazing Jewish components into this, into this celebration 
Um, but then all of a sudden, something amazing happens. Chris, all of a sudden, there is a wind, huge wind that descends upon them, and they are changed instantly. The yes. Spirit of God indwells them in power, uh, and all of a sudden, their lives change to the point that, well, you know, as we talked about Zvi Kalisher. He spoke 11 languages. Uh, we say he has the gift of tongues. Yeah. We used to say, Zvi, you have the gift of tongues. But he had that gift he would be way before he became a Christian. Uh, and he displayed it in the multi-languages that he was able to communicate, whether that was German, Polish, uh, Hebrew, ultimately, other languages. That's what happened here. They're coming from all different places around the, uh, the then world mm -hmm. to Jerusalem, but they all spoke their own language. And when this happened, they were able to speak another person's language that they never studied, never knew. That's an amazing thing. I, can I read from Acts chapter Please 2? Please do. Th so, I'm, I'm giving a bad summary. No, you're not. You're let, doing a great let, summary. Let, let God do it the right way. It's an inspired this, way. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem some God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't, the, aren't are all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, uh, Pontus, and Asia, Phygera, Felicia. Hey, you're doing Felicia, good. You're doing Egypt, good. Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, and they said they've had too much wine. So I always like that little ending there. But the idea is you have Jews uh, from all over the world coming into Jerusalem, just as God commanded them in Deuteronomy chapter 16. And they were celebrating Shavuot, Pentecost. And that's the Jesus had told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Spirit comes, and now all of a sudden, this moment where they're able to hear in the same language, Jews from all over the world, what's being, what's, what's taking place is God is opening a door for the gospel to be given. You know, Chris, I was thinking as you were reading, uh, those of our listeners who's ever been around a tornado, tornado on the outside, they all say the same thing when it, it sounds like a, can you tell me what you, have yeah, you like heard? a train, like a, a freight yeah, train. Freight train yeah. That's right. Can you imagine a tornado indoors? Yeah. This is <laughs> indoors. Yeah. And, a. a the sound is something is happening, and I believe it was tornado-like. It wasn't a, a wind that, like, blew them out. But what happened, they were aware of this presence, and it came upon them. And uh, the fiery tongues, like fiery tongues, this was, I don't think we make a big enough deal as to how much, what this means. This is the foundation of the church. The Church of Jesus Christ was completely, at that time, and only Jewish. You know, I, I'm just reading here because what happens, the moment they hear this, um, Peter starts preaching, which I love. He takes the moment. He didn't care how many words he had. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. He's just going to start preaching. And he spoke a lot, too. He was like you. You know, he talked all the time. All right? the time. And we love it when you talk, Steve. But it says this. It says, as he's preaching, he says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Given the gospel, 3,000 people, Jewish people, came to faith that day. And it's really the, 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 um, the birth of the church. It's where it spreads out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. You know, you and I were talking uh, earlier today just because of the business of, of what we do in North American ministries. And I, I commented to you, Judaism, biblical Judaism, has always taught the Messiah. Always taught. Messianic Jews 
my definition, is any Jewish person who holds to a Messiah. The question has always been, and it was 2,000 years ago, who is this Messiah? Mm -hmm. The argument Jesus was in the Gospels is proclaiming, I am the Messiah. And the Pharisees were saying, no, you're not. Uh, and they were so determined that he wasn't, no matter what he did, they attributed what he did to Satan himself. Yeah. Uh, and so today, that's the same thing. I was a Messianic Jew before I believed in Jesus because I already, I believed in a Messiah. And it was hard for me, in, certainly in my flesh, to cop believe for a moment that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, a human being, and claiming to be God is the Messiah until God opened my eyes. But the point is, those people were coming at Pentecost because they were under the law. They believed what the text was saying, even if they didn't understand everything. And because they were God-fearers, uh, they were open to what these men were preaching in their own language. Imagine, yeah. imagine somebody coming to your house from Russia, you know they're from Russia, and they come and they say, "Hey, Chris, how are you?" Yeah, and they start, <laughs> you listen, right? <laughs> wait a minute, I thought you, you, you came from Russia. Yeah. You, did you ever study English? No, never did. But I could communicate to you. It's it, it's unbelievable. It was a miraculous moment for God to be able to open the door to share the gospel, and we see three thousand. Uh, Jewish people come to the faith in the Lord Jesus, and that becomes the foundation. And, you know, it's funny, I, I don't know how many people realize this, and it's one of the reasons I love doing what I do, but the original church uh, compromised, uh, was was compromised of all Jewish people. It, that's what made up the church. It was Jewish through and through, Jewish Messiah, Jewish apostles, Jewish people made up the first congregation that came together to worship together. It was the first congregation of uh, Israel. That's right. Exactly. Yep. Hey, I, I was just reading this book. It was, it, you know, and I was sharing it with you last night. And it's funny because in the book of Acts, and that's where we are when we're talking about Pentecost, the, the uh, author of the book was talking about the fact that, you know, Luke, who writes Acts, is always trying to drive the, the reader back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem had priority. People gave funds to the church at Jerusalem. People donated. People prayed. People, uh, all the, as the churches were growing and spreading throughout the Roman Empire, Jerusalem, even during that time, still maintained a level of priority because that's where the king is going to return to. So you, you even see that in the early church as well, that there was, you know, even though you had a church in Antioch, you had a church in Philippi, you had a church all over, they still looked to Jerusalem for the coming of the king. And, you know, I look forward to uh, our time in Equip when Menno Kalisher, as we've already talked about, he is pastor of a church in Jerusalem. Yeah, that's right. And so that, that is so exciting when that was planted, starting with a Bible study, to be back to its original roots. Comes Isn't that circle. amazing? Yep, it's, it's amazing. From, Ju from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, but it all comes back to Jerusalem. Amazing. Okay, so uh, we, we, we're we just go going through Pentecost. Again, another festival surrounding uh, uh, a harvest, but also the significance of the giving of the law. But for us as believers, it's the day that the church was born. But now we skip that. That that almost, that almost ends the spring Celebration. It's actually the beginning of summer is 50 days. It's it's almost at summer. That's right. So we we did Passover. That begins it. Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and then we did Feast of Weeks. And that kind of wraps up our, our uh, first four celebr uh, um, uh, festivals. And now we're moving into the fall. So wow. we almost kind of jump over summer. Oh, yeah, you do. Completely. It's now going to be harvest again. We had the first of harvest two different times. And now it's uh, Rosh Hashanah, the uh, Feast of Trumpets, uh, the the call, the shofar. I, you know, I I was I was exercising this morning, Chris, walking as I do every morning, and I had in my head, I better remember to bring my shofar to your office when we record. And of course, I forgot it's in my office. I wish I could bring it, but sh the shofar, the 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 blowing of the horn, the 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 symbol in Judaism of come. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Come. Whether that was the mill Jewish person and Israelite heard the call of the shofar, they knew they had to come. And at Rosh Hashanah, there are, there's the call, the blowing of the shofar. It's traditionally a hundred different toots on the horn, some mm -hmm. long, some short, some medium. Uh, and the idea is a new year. Uh, it's a brand new year, a civil new year. Passover is the 
New Year uh, religious, and the civil New Year is Rosh Hashanah, uh, and it's a new year. But it's it's also a time traditionally now where the Jewish person at Rosh Hashanah it's called one of the high holidays. God doesn't have high holidays, but man does. And I'm not saying that in a negative way. It is to be respected. It's lifted up. Jewish people might not go to the doors of a synagogue, come on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur uh, as the two high holidays. And repentance, it's repentance at Rosh Hashanah. You know, uh, just some of the technical details too, you know, when we talk about Rosh Hashanah, the feast of, of, of festival of trumpets, the feast of trumpets originally didn't start off as a new year. You know, when we say Rosh Hashanah, we're talking in the Hebrew, that literally means the head of the year, yep. the new year that gets developed later on much later. You know, it's, it's interesting because it's almost like just a holiday in its origins. Like you said, the idea of come, you know, it, uh, whenever that shofar was blasted, it brought attention to the hearts and minds of the Israelites. You know, it might call them to battle. You know, it might be the Sabbath is coming. You hear that so far. You know, the, the Feast of Trumpets was, I, I always thought, too, of the earliest identification was to draw people into a day of worship to remember what God had done for them. As you blow that shofar and people's minds and hearts turn to their attention, they go, oh, today is the day that we're going to give, we're, we're going to stop working, we're going to give to the Lord in remembrance. And over time, it develops into a celebration or a, a, a civil uh, um, new year. Day. You know, it's almost like, as you were talking, it's almost like the time uh, when Jewish people remember uh, Remembrance Day uh, for their fallen soldiers. They blow a shofar yeah. that is sounded, and at a certain time, all Israelis know they stop driving, yeah. they, stop, they stop working, and they have a moment, a pause. And I, I go to that. That's not related specifically to Rosh Hashanah, but as you were speaking, the horn the shofar horn meant something. It, it, it arrested them. Yeah. It, it caused them to stop. Uh, and by the way, in synagogue, that's what people wait for at Rosh Hashanah. When you go to synagogue, you wait for the sound of the shofar. It's, it's highly important. It takes a particular skill to play it well. Yeah, it does. Uh, you call, I mean, I could do I've it. I've been to so many events, Steve, where they call the guy to get up to blow the show. It sounds like a cow died. <laughs> you know, he just, I, I, you, you, in it's your... happened to me, Chris. <laughs> it's, I've had some good toots and some bad ones. Uh, but at synagogue, you'll never get a bad one because they call on a person who knows what he's doing. And it's just such an important part of the service. Uh, yeah. Feast of Trumpets, very significant. And that begins the fall festivals uh, uh, of Israel as they begin to wind down into the last one. Uh, so we've actually, I don't think we should spend too much time here, um, but maybe we can highlight what happens in between these two festivals. Uh, Ten days of awe. That's right. Between the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that's the next one. We spent an entire episode on Yom Kippur. So if you want to go back through the archives and find that and listen, please do. Uh, we're not going to get too much into Yom Kippur today like we did in the past. But in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is 10 days. And in, in Judaism today, uh, there's just, like you were saying, 10 days of all. What, what, what's going on there? This is a time that you need to take an inventory, uh, audit for mm -hmm. those accountants out there. You audit your life and say, wait a minute, where have I failed? And you go to whoever you failed. If you, if you uh, borrowed something, never returned it, if you cheated, lied, uh, even a small thing, you go to that person and you make it right because it is this period, Rosh Hashanah, your name, the greeting is, may your name be inscribed in the book of life. That's the desire. And Yom Kippur, it's going to be sealed. In fact, uh, our, one of our equipped courses, we did these three feasts, one each day. And you said they could go back and look at that. Uh, and so Yom Kippur uh, is the time it's sealed, but Rosh Hashanah is the time I got to evaluate my life. Mm -hmm. I got to take inventory. So while the new year comes and I eat apples or and challah and honey, challah the bread and dip dip them into the honey. I want a sweet year. I want a good year. Rosh Hashanah as a new year is celebrated entirely different than the way many people did just a, a week ago, Chris, uh, with drinking and dancing. And that's not the way it's done uh, amongst those who observe Rosh Hashanah because it's there's a solemnity to it. There's yeah. a, it's a solemn, ooh, uh, 
God is going to, I'm going to be in the book of life or in the book of judgment. Mm -hmm. And I want to be in the book of life. I better have out, where did I go wrong? How can I make that right? And so that 10 days is an opportunity between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur to make amends, uh, to find forgiveness. And they're not actually just turning to God for forgiveness. They're actually commanded to go to the people that they've hurt and, and to ask for forgiveness. You know, if they've hurt somebody or, or you know, whatever the case might be, if you've sinned against somebody, you have to go to that person and ask for forgiveness. And that is what, you know, will ultimately, after those 10 days, move you into the book of life on on uh, Yom Kippur. Now, none of that's biblical, Steve. That's none, rabbinical. That's all not biblical. rabbinical. Yeah. All rabbinical. But these feasts are are biblical. And the idea of trumpets and then the idea of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, which we already talked a little bit about mm -hmm. uh, w when we covered what the priests had to do. Now we're in uh, chapter 23. And again, we're confronted with Yom Kippur. It is, it is the Day of Atonement. It is not a time of eating. This is one of the feasts where there's no food. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I didn't, yeah, I forgot about that. There's no eating. It's a real solemn time. It's actually a time of fasting. It, it uh, is. And, 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 and taking a break from, from the things that are around you to focus solely on God. And to think about the development that's happened even, to think about, like, you know, before the temple was destroyed, people brought their sacrifices. Uh, um, people brought, in Yom Kippur, there was a sacrifice that took place. There was the Azazel lamb. There was the, the shedding of the blood. There was all that. And now we live in a world where there is no temple. Jew Jewish people had to reformat Yom Kippur to be more focused on prayer and fasting and repentance and, and things of that nature in order to still live to the, to the, you know, somewhat of the letter of what Leviticus 23 is teaching, but really it can never add up to it as long as that temple is not there. When the temple's destroyed, the question was asked, and it's in the Talmud, and I, I we reviewed this when we went over uh, chapter 16, uh, and that is uh, the student turns to the rabbi and says, what are we going to do? Our temple's destroyed. How are we going to atone for our sins? That is the fundamental question. It's the right question. Unfortunately, in the Talmud, the rabbi gives what we is in evangelical Christianity and what I think biblical Judaism teaches. He gave the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. We remember a life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you on the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that makes an atonement. And so the rabbi turned to the student and said, from now on, just as you outlined, Chris, we'll repent, we'll set, we'll fast. We'll pray and we'll give charity. Charity, yep. In other words, good works. Mm -hmm. And they are good. I, from our standpoint, anytime you're you're talking about praying, uh, recognizing you're not the end of the, of all things. Anytime you're talking about helping the poor and 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 those kinds of th those are good things. But in no way can we work our way to God. We yeah. talked about this throughout Le the purpose of Leviticus. He is holy. Chris, yeah. you and I are not holy. No, and that was that. That's the whole point of, especially of what, what, what you know. When we look at Yom Kippur, you know, it, it's interesting because in Israel they just uncovered uh, an area in Yavna, Israel, which doesn't appear in our Bibles. You know, we don't think of Yavna. You know, we don't think of it like Galilee. Strategic in Judaism, but Yavna is very strategic. When we talk about that transition moment after the temple was destroyed, the Jewish people were pushed out of Jerusalem, and there is where the Pharisees. Uh, rebuilt Judaism uh, and, and and really took a lot of that oral law that uh, Jesus was actually speaking against and reformatted it to make it uh, um, applicable as possible without a temple. It's amazing how many of the laws are absolutely dependent on a central worship place in a temple. And without it there, they had to reformat a bunch of what they oh, did. Oh, they reformatted. Again, I can't, I have to go back to Zvi. Zvi used to talk about when he talked to the Hasidic community and he did all the time. He said, you have to carry along books, a library with you of all what the rabbis say. He said, I just carry one book. God tells us what to do, where we're going, how we're getting there. He's the one I put my faith in. You can't, you need a truck to carry all the books of the rabbis and how they disagree and agree. He said, I don't do that. It, he hit the nail on the head every time he talked to them. And this is the same example. In Yavna, they, they codified, began to codify the oral law and began to write and this rabbi said that. And again, there's wisdom. There's, there is, yeah. there's Christian scholars who 
Look at the Talmud and the writing, the Zohar and all those. They do that. But there's only one book of 66 books that that's inspired by God. That's right. And it's all that we need, too, to understand revelation about how to come to faith in Christ, how to receive salvation in Christ, what salvation means, how it roots back to Yom Kippur and Passover. All of that is tied into what the scriptures teach. You can't find it in any other book. Now we're going to go from Yom Kippur, though, Chris, to what? It's a great celebration. I, I love that, you know, God always ends with a bang. And that's a, a big, you know, a big party. And the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, is a big party. It's another feast that's surrounded around a harvest. But, you know, the Feast of Weeks and the Pentecost, Shavuot, are barley harvests and wheat harvests. And that's great. You need bread to live. But what you harvested uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles, this is where joy is. It's olives and grapes for for wine and for the celebration of all the different fruits and the dates and uh, and and the, the pomegranate. figs, the pomegranates, all of these things that you know, bread is great. But when you get that fruit and that jam and all that great olives, I am sure this was a great time of celebration. Another time when Jewish people were actually required to come back to Jerusalem to honor it as well. Sukkot. Sukkot begins five days after Yom Kippur, and Chris, you know, many evangelicals go to Jerusalem before COVID. They were going huge amounts. What's interesting is just as you said, as, as Yom Kippur ends, the moment the sun goes down and it's the next day, uh, Jewish people, uh, Israelis are, especially since they're in apartments and on those balconies, they begin to build the sukkah right after Yom Kippur. Yeah. It's almost as though they're saying, Yes, you know, this is important. I'm going to be sealed in the book of life or the book of judgment, but I can hardly wait to celebrate the sun is down and I'm building that sucker. Yeah, if you ever get a chance, maybe you live in Brooklyn or maybe you have been to Brooklyn. Uh, if you ever get a chance uh, in Brooklyn, uh, you'll see during um, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, just the streets are lined. Uh, with sukkahs on the on the balconies of people's homes, they don't have a big property where they can build a a tent or a, a tabernacle outside of their home. So they just put it right on their balcony, and it's so it's it's adorable looking. Everybody decorates them and they eat in them as much as they can. They sleep in them. Some of them, yes, yeah, sleep in them. I've celebrated in Brooklyn. I've celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles with some uh, Hasidic Jew, Jewish friends, and it was a great time. It's a time of celebration, dancing. Oh, they dance like crazy. And uh, really, it's a it's a time when God is giving the best to the people. And a reminder, I love this, the real, the real meaning of it is that you would build a booth that you live in for seven days. And you build that booth as a reminder of the fact that God took care of our people. He provided a temporary shelter. He provided for us as we were walking 40 years through the wilderness. He pro provided our food. He provided our shelter, provided the food on our, uh, the shoes on our feet. He gave, even though we were in the wilderness, he led, he guided, and provided. Chris, why don't you read a couple of verses, if you will. Go back to Leviticus. We were in Acts. Now we got to go back to Leviticus 23. Why don't you read a couple of those verses concerning tabernacles? Yeah, okay, that's good, because I jumped. Where are you going? I see you going somewhere, I'm going too. to Leviticus 23. Okay, good, because I, I moved to Zechariah 14. But okay, we'll that's get... good. Let me just read a couple of verses, then you could take the Zechariah part, okay? All right, good. And I hope our listeners, we're, we're doing this on the fly, right, Chris? We're having a great time. <laughs> and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, solemn assembly, and you shall do no work that therein. And then if you drop by to 40, verse 40, and you shall take first day of the boughs of goodly trees, branches, palm trees, and the boughs of thick tree, thick trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice, there's that key word, before the Lord your God mm. seven days. So they have a lulav and a netrog. Uh, a etrog is like a lemon with a funny stem on it. And then they have the, the uh, lulav, which is a willow branch. Uh, and you wave, every, you wave it before the Lord. It is, you go north, south, east, west, and you're proclaiming to God, 
thank you mm -hmm. for the bounty. We are rejoicing. We are glad. We realize that what we have, what we had when we were wandering around, you provided. What we have now, you have provided. God, you have provided. You, you are the one who is the provider. And tabernacles then becomes a focal point to the Apostle John when he writes. It's, because yes. It's an incredible thing. I know you're reading Zechariah. Let me just say that uh, God tabernacled, John tells us, uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and tabernacled, set his tent amongst us. Yeah. Chris, you know, the, the bad part, yeah, I think of the two guys walking on the road to Emmaus. They had no idea who they were with. They had no idea. I mean, they knew he was a great teacher. The very end of Luke. Yeah. yeah. He had no idea. They're depressed. Once, once he once he left, they they were like, I can't, I can't believe who was here. Yep. Because he tabernacled in his resurrection body with them. Yeah. Man, it pops up so many times. You think of Amos chapter nine at the very end of Amos. It seems very dire and, 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 and all things are falling apart for Israel. And then at the very end of Amos, God gives this really big push at the end. And he says, no, but we're going to restore all things. And I am going to resurrect uh, essentially resurrect or rebuild or reconstruct the destroyed or crumbled booth Sukkot or, 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 or uh, uh, a sukkah of David. I'm going to rebuild it. That, that idea of a sukkah, then Zechariah. Oh, Zechariah is great for you guys, the Gentile. I know we love this one. This is why Jew uh, Gentile Christians uh, go to Jerusalem during uh, Feast of Tabernacles because of what the prophecy says, that when Jesus returns, when the Messiah comes, it says in verse 16, it says, then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And that, that's amazing, the idea that even in the, end times, even in the prophetic vision that is being casted, that all the nations that, that survived the tribulation, uh, who, who turned to the Lord Jesus, uh, they come and they gather in Jerusalem to celebrate uh, the goodness of God and the way that he provides and gives, given his son, provided his son, all of it. You could wrap it all up. The Feast of Tabernacles is a time to rejoice and the nations come to rejoice. I love it when the nations get involved in the Jewish festival. Well, you know, in that same prophet, in that same book, 10 Gentiles grab the skirt or grab the clothing of a Jewish person. So it's 10 to one. Yep. But they're not, they're not going after the Jews in a bit. I want to, I want to go to Jerusalem and worship with you because Jerusalem is going to be the center of the earth, just as Ezekiel 5.5 5 says. Uh, one more, too, Steve, is Mount of Transfiguration. Great place. Yes. <laughs> Jesus is up there. He reveals his glory uh, to the three disciples. And Peter says, Lord, this is good. And it's then he, good to be here. It's so good to be here, Jesus. <laughs> the most understated, great <laughs> event ever. Peter, he takes the cake. That's right. And he says, should we build booths? Essentially, one for Moses, that's right. one for you, one, one for Elijah. We uh, God crazy. came down. Yep. The idea that you've tabernacled with us should we build a booth? And and I, it's always I always wish I could see Jesus in those moments when he, goes, uh, you know, wait a moment. So uh, well, but, God the Father says in my language, "Shut up, Peter." <laughs> That's what. He said. But his heart was Listen in the right place. Yeah. That's right. Oh, his no, heart was in the right I place. I love Peter. So, uh, you know, that actually wraps up the seven different feasts of Leviticus 23. Steve, really quick, though, can we tie it into, into history and prophetic future as well? You know, as we looked at Passover, the spring feast, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of, uh, of uh, Weeks, uh, uh, First Fruits, those, those four, they actually have some connection to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Absolutely, Chris. The, we have Passover. Passover, of course, is redemption. Uh, Passover is the Passover lamb. Passover is when I see the blood, I'll pass over, the lamb of God. For us, we think Passover. Jesus celebrated the Passover. He became the lamb for us. And then immediately following Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Sanctification, 
were set apart as believers, uh, brought into the family of God, and are fit immediately when we trust him to be in his presence. Right at that very moment, through the shed blood of Christ, we are fit to be with him. Mm. First fruits, Christ resurrects. And hey, if he he's our guarantee. Wait a minute. If he resurrects, we're in him. Yes. Wherever he is, we're going to be, we're guaranteed. And we're going to be up with him. Fast forward to Pentecost, the two loaves that are given, uh, in the leaven. Is there leaven in the church today? Oh, there's leaven in the church today. You have those, those two loaves, Jew and Gentile. We're the Jew and Gentile podcast. That's exactly. We are, uh, and, we are. But we're one in the body of Christ, but there's two different people, not just people, but representing two different groups, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 32, give no offense to the Jews, to the Greeks, or to the church of God. Then we fast forward to trumpets and are, are reminded that there will be a trumpet. We can A trumpet that will call Israel, the Jewish people, back to the land. That's certainly the interpretation prophetically, but I think we can apply to it because the church is waiting for that sound, mm -hmm. the sound of the shofar, where we will be called to meet him in the air. That's not the interpretation, but boy, we can we can re certainly relate to that. And before you go on, though, you know, you just talked about the spring festivals, looking at redemption history from the New Testament in Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and then also the birth of the church. But it's almost like that summer break is a little, it's a time period because now we're moving, like you were just saying, the trumpet call Israel going back home, the trumpet of the, 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 the rapture of the church. Um, that's moving us into prophetic future. Uh, with the fall feast. Absolutely. I'm, gl I'm glad you stopped me. That's that's exactly right. Then we come to uh, y y the repentance. Think every time you and I have a service at our local church and we're about to take communion, aren't we supposed to take inventory? Mm -hmm. Just like the Jewish people do. Not for salvation, but certainly there has to be repentance. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Yom Kippur, we know that uh, the, through the shed blood of Christ, that is our day of not just atonement. That's our when we receive Christ, it's our day of redemption. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the for the Israelis, for, for Jewish people, Yom Kippur is that time when Jesus Christ returns, and those who are alive to receive Him, they will recognize Him whom they pierced and mourn for Him as one mourns for an only child. And then five days later, tabernacles. Jesus Christ returns to the earth, mm. tabernacles once again. He was here the first time. He's coming back, and this time he's not coming as the lamb. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah in power and authority, fire in his eyes. Those who reject him will be judged, and he will touch down on uh, the Mount of Olives. It's split in two. He'll walk down and up that Kidron Valley through the Eastern Gate, which you have seen, Chris, many times, and uh, Muslims have put bricks up there. Yep. They put a grave there because, oh, the Messiah can't go through. Uh, we, we've already talked about it in our podcast. Oh, the, you can't go through the graves because it's unclean. Uh, <laughs> they think that bricks are going to stop the Messiah <laughs> from coming through. Yeah, I, I believe they're going to like vanish yes. right before him. And the son of David will sit on a throne. And that throne is not the throne he's seated at right now next to the father. This is the Davidic throne, and he will be physically, bodily seated there. And that's when everybody's going to come. And what a day that will be. That's right. Feast of Tabernacles. So there you go. We just walked you through the festivals of Israel from Leviticus chapter 23. We made it a two-part episode for you there. Oh, yeah, we could have probably had needed three. <laughs> we rushed there at the end. But, yeah, we, 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 but you know, I really think it's important to see that God also has a, a timetable through this as well. You can see the imagery in the in the celebration of the different festivals from the beginning uh, uh, from Passover to to Pentecost the, the 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 death burial resurrection of Jesus the 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 uh, uh, birth of the church and then the prophetic future that's that's awaiting us so all that wrapped up in in the feast but Steve let's transition ourselves now and move to the news okay. we've got two items we here. do have two items and uh, this is. Chris, I, I showed you this beforehand and told you that we'd like to do this for the news. This comes from thesun.com, and the headline reads, Man's Last Hope Inside the Real Life, Noah's Ark Designed to Save Mankind After the Apocalypse with a Backup Vault 
on the moon. <laughs> I don't understand this. <laughs> this is uh, this it, it, as a believer. That's I, I laugh. To me, this is this is a comedy, but it's as serious as you can imagine. These people are uh, a, a solar powered arc would cryogenically store the frozen samples from 6.7 million species underground in the moon. In the moon. On the moon. On, there's a whole diagram here in the article. We'll include that when you mail this out to people. They can access it. <laughs> it's going to take, according to the article, 240 trips from the Earth to the moon and then back and loading them up again when it took 40 shots of uh, uh, rockets to go build the International Space Center. How many? 200 and what? 240 times they're going to have to do this. And they believe that it will be able to start happening in 2030. I, this is what I don't understand. Okay, <laughs> let's just say we, let's just interpret this. The apocalypse comes. Explain to me how we're going to get all the things designed to function on Earth off the moon again. What? Where is that apparatus? I don't, that's what I, I understand if you're putting it in some uh, place on earth that you can access, it's deep underground. I, I don't know. But the moon, like what, what is this supposed to happen? I, that I don't, is there something that kickstarts? Does it send it back to earth? What's going on? I, I don't know. Here's, here's Have how they, they thought end, about that part. Of here's the-, the end of the article. And this is their way out. More research needs to be done yeah. on the impact of lack of gravity on seeds. <laughs> So this whole thing could fall they, apart. Based they wrote on- a whole, but you know, Chris, the reason I think it's important, it's to be honest with you. Look, I don't have a science degree. It's goofy to me. However, the reason behind what's the motivation. Yeah. Why are they motivated to do this? Why do they want to save mankind? The idea of survival. And here you and I just finished a study of the outline of the seven feasts and we painted a, a picture of God's prophetic plan, not to destroy man. That's right. And not to move him off the earth, but to re reconstruct, if you will, re- reconcile mm-hmm. and then build back what God intended originally in the garden. So mankind's not going to be completely destroyed. Quite the contrary. God's going to satisfy his holiness uh, as well as demonstrate his love. Here they're just saying there's no hope for earth. Yeah, we, we got to find a place and hopefully through some magic, these seeds will then germinate somehow. But we have to do more research. I wish they would search the scriptures to see. The truth. It's funny that they're looking toward an apocalypse, too, which means that they think something absolutely horrible is going to happen. You know, we're looking at an apocalypse as well. Like it's 100 percent. It's embedded in the scriptures. Um, but like you said, Steve, we're not looking at the apocalypse as the end. We're looking at the apocalypse really as the beginning of how God is going to resurrect the earth. Uh, the apocalypse is the judgment that God is bringing to the earth uh, because of sin. That's actually this, you know, it, it's it's interesting because when you, they, they call it Noah's Ark, the yep. modern Noah's Ark. But really Noah's Ark was designed to preserve life because God's judgment was coming, but he wanted to bring things back to way, the way they were supposed to be. And if you look at what the future holds for the apocalypse, for what the book of Revelation teaches, God will judge this earth. That's what the whole New Testament is about. Judgment is coming, but God has provided a way so that when judgment comes, you will not feel the wrath of God. Instead, you will embrace life, a life everlasting, eternal life as he resurrects everything that he's created to the way he intended it to be in the garden of Eden. And you know, we, I did say, this is, you said, I don't understand. I said, Oh, this sounds just goofy to me, but I think we ought to respect this. And, and, and you're right. The apocalypse, they have the right idea. They have that sense of this isn't going to be here all the time. And they have a sense that man by himself will, it will only lead to destruction. We agree with that. Yeah. We we disagree that man, knowing that man's going to be destroyed, that somehow man can fix it. Yeah. And we believe we say, no, man can't fix the doomsday that man is destined to have. We believe God's going to intercede and it's his plan to ultimately bring it to fruition. That's and right. what a wonderful 
thing that will be Genesis all over. All over. That's right. All right. So moving on, Steve, that's a funny, I, <laughs> it's serious, but it's also yeah, funny. Yeah. That's I, again, I think it's goofy, but I think at least they're on the right track. That's they right. They are, they are understanding what they see. This, this next one is really fascinating to me. Uh, there's this uh, uh, source, Alma, and the history is the anti-Semitic history of the early 2000s fashion brand, Von Deutsch. Uh, you know, Chris, I don't know fashion. You at least heard of that before. Yeah. I didn't. Uh, let me just read the end, and then maybe you could fill in. I was going to college when this was a really popular brand, and I will say, too, it's not cheap. You know, we're not talking about, we're talking about a hat that costs $200. You know, a hat, like a trucker's hat, the way they design them. So this guy was making a lot of money off of making, well, uh, but guy, it became a, a very big brand for celebrities too. The, the guy you're talking about is named Kenny Howard, and he made a name for himself in the 30s for his pinstriping, painting, and yes, prejudice. Uh, the original, the origins of the nickname Van Dutch or Dutch are up for debate it is either self-proclaimed translation of to buy German or a family nickname deeming Howard as a stubborn as a Dutchman. His painting can be, pinstriping can be found on hundreds of motorcycles, cars, popularized flame jobs on cars, and a signature flying eyeball. The name can be found on almost everything he created. Uh, it's, a, it's been on bowling bags and trucker hats as well. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's interesting about this is how anti-Semitic he was. And in fact, before he died, here's what they found. He said, I'm not willing to go through it anymore, only to emerge in a place full of a very negative word, uh, Mexicans and Jews. I have always been a Nazi and still believe in that last name. Uh, the, the last time the world had a chance of being operated with logic. What a shame so many Americans died and suffered to make the rich richer and save England and France again. Or was that still? I hope you lying wimps get swallowed up with your stupidity. That's that was Kenny Howard before he died. He admitted his, his final words, his final words, as anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic uh, Nazi is yeah. what he says. But here here's the ending of this. And, and this is what we need to talk about, I think, as a concept of how we identify what we buy and what statements are we making with fashion? Mm -hmm. Because it says. The curse of Von Duch, a brand to die for, in quotation marks, underlined, this is the author now, Jewish, who says what I already knew, fashion and pop culture brands are always about more than just clothes. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. What you wear makes a statement and who you wear can reflect who you are or want to be. I love the resurgence of Y2K fashion, and I love that fashion continues to teach me new things about the world every day. But as a Jewish woman, the author writes, I've added Von Dutch to a list of brands that will never enter my closet. Look, Chris, you could look at me. I'm not a fashion guy. You're making a statement, though. I'm making a statement that I am not a fashion guy. I didn't know anything about it. It caught my eye, and uh, it caught it because it's anti... The, I, the, there are people wearing clothes that are have a source from a person who is extremely anti-Semitic. And you and I talked about this earlier because the the deeper lesson here is exactly what that author said. Um, she was saying that the idea of fashion these days is not just about going to the store to buy whatever shirt and put it on, that fashion almost celebrates something. It has a meaning attached to it these days. People want to attach something to give more value to the clothes that you're wearing. So you'll spend more money on it. Um, you know, I, I, I always like wearing my I, Tom's shoes. You know, it's a it's a great pair of like shoes. They almost look like nothing. But the, the, the meaning was good. You buy these shoes and we'll ship a pair to somebody. That's fantastic. I love the meaning and significance behind it. But, you know, there what what this author is saying is that there is there's a lot of meaning often tied to fashion and significance and you know is what are the thing that we're wearing do we have to start doing research now to find out hey what is this thing actually promoting i know i like the way it looks i know i like the way that hat looks on me I, it's a very expensive hat and i'll and look you cool. like how other people react when you're wearing yeah, oh you're wearing a hat like that you know how much that costs oh i know how much it costs i just spent that money on it but when you begin to actually dig deeper 
is what you're buying actually of, of great value in what it represents. And I think she nailed it, you know, right on the head that look at, I will never put that stuff in my closet because that man was anti-Semitic. He was, uh, he was, uh, anti-black. He was anti-Mexican. It was a, a horrible racist man. And, you know, but you wouldn't ever think that cause I just want to buy that hat. You know, the question is always, and it's debated amongst athletes today. Uh, there, I, we're not going political, but, uh, there's a whole thing about the Olympics and China and how they're treating people and what should the reaction be? That's what we as a culture in America are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And in the Western world, not just America, is, is what our sources, Apple, with those of us who have iPhones, that there's a country that is persecuting a people, and yet we're buying the goods and say, well, you know, we can't control it. It's, it we're convoluted. We're, we're, we, we struggle. Mm -hmm. And here the, the author of, of this piece is Jewish and she had a struggle, but she came to the conclusion, I can't do this. I, no matter how good and how favorable this brand is and how much cachet it gets, I'm not going to be part of it. You got to admire that kind of thing. And it, hopefully we take inventory and begin to evaluate, Hey, I'm making statements all the time about what I wear, how I present myself, that's pretty important. Yeah, and you're definitely, like I said, making a statement. So <laughs> thanks for doing that. <laughs> no fashion sense at all. Nah, you're good. You're good. Well, listen, everybody, it's been a, a great Jew and Gentile podcast. We're not over. Oh, we're not? We got a word. Oh, my a goodness. Word. Wait, you... that's right. Wait a second. Let me bring it back down. Oh, Chris, oh, my you can't goodness. avoid. Oh, yeah, 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 Actually, yeah. maybe I did that on purpose. Maybe. All right. We'll, that's we'll a good way we'll to get out of it. <laughs> All right, well, then why don't you lead the way uh, for the Yiddish oh, word of the I day? What was I you, thinking? You said, I think it's the Spirit of God who That's used right. you to make a giant mistake <laughs> and a point. And that is our two words today. We put them together. Oi, vey. Come on, Chris. Oi, vey. Oi, vey, Chris. You don't want to do that. What's oi, vey mean? Chris has the technical aspect. I grew up with oi, vey. Uh, we use it all the time here in the office. I've taught a number of our staff who were never raised with Yiddish, all about Oive. It's used amongst Hollywood people and talk shows. People hear this Yiddish word. Oive is, from a, from my perspective, it's, oh my, oh my goodness, uh, woe is me. Well, uh, that's Oive's mirror, but uh, that's what it means. But Chris, you have the technical aspect. Well, I know you, you nailed it. It's Oi and Ve are two very old Jewish interjections, which both mean woe. So you're actually saying, when you say oi, you're saying the Hebrew word for woe. And when you say ve, you're saying the Aramaic word for woe. So I didn't know just, I was bilingual. So you're just saying whoa, whoa. <laughs> Trilingual. <laughs> <laughs> but oi has actually found, uh, Steve, I didn't know this. Because I you've you've rubbed off on me and working with you in the office. And so I'd hear you go oi. And now I know our uh, assistant, Laura, she goes oi. And I know I go, I go home and I go Oi, you know, so it's rubbed off, you know, whoa, you know, so you're, woe is me. Uh, but it's actually in the Bible. It, the Hebrew word that's found three times, oi, the Hebrew word is found three times in Numbers 21, 29, 1 Samuel 4, 7, and Isaiah 3, 11. Oi to the wicked sinners, for they will get exactly what they deserve. Oi to you, Moab, you are ruined, O people of uh, Chemish. Uh, he has made his son's fugitives. Oi, oi, oi. It's all over the place. So anyway, I think that's interesting. And it's perfect setup when you thought it was over. That's what I thought. Oi, what are you doing? I know. What are, what are, I, I almost ruined that. That was because it was such a good word. I was so perfect excited. Perfect setup. We're, we're, doing, we're, we're really original here in, in Jew-Gentile podcast. Oi, ve, schmear. That's one of my favorite ones that you do, Steve. Well, listen, it's been a great Jew and Gentile podcast. Maybe I'll get it right next time and I'll know exactly when to end. But I'm so thankful that you could join us. Just a fresh reminder, go to gofoi.org forward slash ZV Legacy to sign up for our FOI Equip class, uh, which is all about the life of ZV. You're not going to want to miss it. Again, that's gofoi.org. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, all over the place. Be sure to like us. Be sure to make a comment. We need it all. So thank you so much. Have a great one. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.